not live yet. Not live yet. Hi. Well, mine says you're not live. You could be. Oh, starting. Hi. Stream health is green. Receiving your content. Oh, you're live. Oh, I need to do some stretches. Too late. You're live. Uh, no. Nope. No more time for stretching. This is back door it's stuff. Happening. Everyone, get ready for this. I'm gonna be super pumped after I stretch. Whoa. Okay, you guys, we're we're live. I'm Derek from Pacific Coast Auto, the owner. And uh, we're live on the YouTubes, and I got two wingmen today. Uh, we got Andrew, say what's up, Andrew. What's up, Andrew? <laughs> and Mike, say what's up, Andrew. What's up, Andrew? And now and Andrew, answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing much. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna be here for an hour doing live question and answer for you guys. And so if you've got questions about importing cars from Japan to whatever country that you're from, then go ahead and post those. We also have the uh, screen here where we can look up some of the cars for auction. And uh, house cleaning first. Make sure that you don't post anything that's USS related because we're not allowed to show that. Uh, and then Lord, questions, Lord, pr pretty much anything Lord, goes. And if we don't like the question, then uh, I just won't answer it. And if it's anything racist, you're going to be kicked out of here like a couple of weeks ago. I'm setting up the trolls in okay. case you guys know. Van Hammer is ready. Yeah, <laughs> anyone's racist. Okay, so I, we got a number of people in the chat here. That's pretty rad. Um, and I uh, just wanted to start off by uh, asking everyone where you're coming from because that's kind of cool to see. I see uh, Meteora the Fox says it's 4 a.m. Must be somewhere in Europe, I suppose. And then he said, nope. Nope, lol. Tell Mike I said, what's up? Lol, I need that dad mobile. I love your channel. Oh, yes. Thank you, Accord79. You've been a subscriber for like a number of years. I remember seeing your posts like maybe four or five years ago at least. Uh, Kazi says this, which is funny, actually. I just watched... Um, the Karate Kid, like the 1984 original Karate Kid with my wife last night. First movie I've seen in like a year because I really don't have time. And it's funny because like I don't have any time to watch movies at all. We have we rented that from YouTube. It costs 300 yen to rent from YouTube. And um, we had it rented for like three and a half weeks before we actually got a chance to watch it. And so I'm very glad to uh, finally have got that done. And in the movie he, he goes like this and he rubs his hands together and then he can he can cure people just with the power of hands. And so that's what it made me think of. Who wouldn't want this job? Every day is JDM. What, what in, I'm not gonna read that one. <laughs> Do you see which one I'm reading? Yeah. <laughs> Ban him. No, don't. That's, uh, if he said it more prof profanely, then we can ban him. 7 p.m., it's perfect time. Are you excited? That was me. Uh, okay. Okay, somebody's in the Arctic Circle. Is that real? Yeah. Cool. Maybe Norway? Or maybe uh, the north of Canada? Hey Derek, I'm from Argentina. Uh, you have a question. I'm going to start answering questions in just a sec, so I'll keep that one up there. Somebody says Aknet, I believe. 5 a.m. In, in Bulgaria. My gosh, I can't believe that people stay up till 5 a.m. or wake up that early for that matter. Uh, somebody says, hello excited from Denver, Colorado. What's up, Denver? People in Denver. Uh, what else? Fort Drum, New York. Never heard of it. It's Sorry. Army base. It's an army base? Yep. That's cool. Let's start this proper. What's up, guys? Okay, and, uh, oh, here's a good question. How do you feel about the whole rib suit debacle? Um, keep that question for after. I'm going to answer the first one. And so, let's see, Leo Vinalgo, sorry for mispronunciation, says, Hey Derek, I'm from Argentina and I have a question. Did you ever play the tapes you found in the back of the Honda City? I've been curious ever since. Um, I have not, but I have been thinking about it since it has the original CD, I'm sorry, pre-CD player, original tape deck in that car. I was thinking it would really be blasphemy to install anything like a CD player or Bluetooth into a car that's that old. 1983 and so going forward I'm going to make my own mixtapes which is something I haven't done since high school <laughs> and making mixtapes really sucks because um, like after CDs you can just pick your playlist from iTunes and then you can just write a CD and it's all easy but with the making your own mixtape you have to wait while you're listening to the track and then press stop and then queue up the next tape and then press play and record at the same time and so I'm gonna I'm gonna try doing that again uh, no pain then no happiness. That's what I always say. Actually, yeah, that's the first time I've ever said that. 
Okay, so, uh, yeah, I, I know a lot of people are curious to see what kind of music's in there. I'm guessing it's not going to be as cool as you think that it is. It'll probably be some 80s pop from some 80s pop star that is bad at singing. <coughs> okay, so, yeah, if you guys want to uh, send something in from the, uh, the auctions, then give me the auction name and number and preferably the name of the car as well so I know what I'm getting into. Two so far. Okay. Two six zero zero one. Spanish on GTX should be an Ocknet. Hmm, that's an interesting one. So Ocknet isn't a real auction; they're just a pretend one. Basically, what the dealers can do is they can post their car at auction without having it leave your dealer lot, and it typically means that the cars stay unsold for a very long amount of time because, generally speaking, they want a lot of money for them. This person doesn't say how much that they want, but the starting price is 2.7 million. I'm guessing they're going to want a little amount more than that. Um, maybe 3.5, maybe 4. It is a bit interesting how there's steely wheels on it, but lowered suspension. I got cat hair on my nose. Ah, my cat has been bothering me. Yesterday, so my cat, whenever we're not looking, my cat pees on carpet or clothing that's left on the floor, and it drives us nuts because, for obvious reasons. Um, yesterday, I caught my cat trying to poop on clothes. And he's done it a few times when we haven't been looking, but this is the first time he had, he had the, the gall to do it in front of me. And he looked at me while he was squatting down. So I said no, and I picked him up, and I put him into the litter box, and then I didn't let him out until he pooed. And he didn't poo, he just ran out of there into the shower room. And didn't. He, luckily he didn't poo in there either, and then he didn't poo on the floor for the rest of the day. But he's getting a little bit more brazen with his poop tactics. <laughs> okay, back to this car. Uh, <laughs> Skyline looks like it. Uh, I don't know what engine that is because it doesn't look like an L28 <laughs> engine. That must be the original engine that came in these. Do, 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 do. 2000 cc. But it has the triple carbs on the side, one barrel per cylinder. Very cool, straight through. Your air goes in and then it comes out. It's kind of interesting to see an engine with the intake and the exhaust on the same side, but back in this era, a lot of engines were like that, including my Honda City Turbo. And it's kind of weird to think that the City Turbo has the intake and then the exhaust with a turbo all on one side of the engine. That looks cool. I mean, the uh, engine was taken out in order to do the repaint. I don't think that this is original paint. With Ocknet, we get these weird get these weird uh, sheets here and then the the whole translation is down here but almost illegible they have a Japanese version that we can check if we go to the uh, like Ocknet or ASNet server looks cool I don't really know what else to say about it it looks cool though these older cars it's hard to find one without rust repair and so it's a good idea to kind of assume that there's semi semi okay rust repair on it sometimes it's really bad though so do be careful if I like if it were me that were buying a classic Japanese sports car I'd either do it from auction and see the car in person or buy it from a dealer it's really hard to buy something like this without knowing all the details about it and you just don't get enough info from the the auction sheet in my opinion okay we got another one to go before we uh, talk about the rib sue thing do you want a Suzuki Swift Sport and a Zuzu Bellet or a fairly 280Z Mike why don't you pick 280 All right, yeah. so that's 1052 at CAA Gifu so this one's gonna be similar to the last one I suppose both 70s Japanese Nissans uh, oh a ZX eh? okay I wasn't expecting that do, 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 do. Let's go up there. There we go. Yeah, this is the car that a lot of people started hating Nissan because they took a really beautiful shape and really bastardized it. Um, I don't think it's a terribly bad car, but the earlier ones are just so much better looking than these ones were. I guess cool wheels on it. It looks like it has the USDM bumpers on it. That's a little bit strange. USDM tight. Okay, has a boost gauge. What engine is in these? L28 engine with a turbo kit. Wow, that's a weird one. 
Hmm. The, as far as I know, the L28 never came with a turbo on it. So this is really cool. So let's read this over. L28 engine swap. 280 turbo kit from HKS. Um, chamber type suction... No? Suction bro? <laughs> <laughs> Essential mod. <laughs> <laughs> a suction bro. Yeah, that's what every car guy needs on his car is some suction bro. Uh, um, bro by. Blow by kit. Okay, here's the weird thing about Japanese is you can stop a word right at the very end and just continue the word on the next line, but this person put a star there, which makes me believe that it's not part of the word. Kind of weird. Uh, turbo back exhaust, intercooler, and CPU from HKS. Looks like quite a bit of damage here from the accident, so let's go over this. Right front side panel dented, core support has been modified. Engine makes strange sounds. Engine has white smoke coming from it. Floor side member has been pushed up. Dashboard is cracked. Interior and interior liners, um, I think that says cracked. End panel repair marks, underside scratched and dented, full repaint on it, exterior small scratches. Engine area oil leak, rear hatch damper doesn't work, left electric folding mirror doesn't work, and aftermarket wheels. So, the car's kind of cool that it's a turbo L28. Um, I like the, the handmade turbo scoop here. Looks like it's made, been made out of like a just aluminum box metal. Weird car. I don't suppose it would sell for a lot, but there could be some guy who's like, I really need a turbo L28 in a 280ZX. Hmm. Look at this. Starting price is a million yen. That's a bit of a stretch, I think. The car may be cool, but I don't think it's that cool. I could see it not selling. So we'll see about that one. Okay. Is it possible to find Lada or Neva in Japan? Not really. Um, they're basically non-existent here unless somebody was brave enough to import one to a country that has no factories that can repair them. 300ZX want a car? Want a B car? Oh, yeah, I suppose. I, I guess it was just Nissan not knowing which direction to go with the styling of it. I can see how they thought that this would have been an improvement over the last one, because the older version is very 60s, 70s Japanese metal looking, and then this one is more toward your 80s. As much as I love 80s cars, they are, they were like a step down in terms of styling. Nissan Sunny, is this with real mileage? Somebody's asking. Um, I can answer that question pretty easily. No, they all have five digit odometers and so it can roll over pretty easily. Someone's at the door. Do left hand drive Mercedes in Japan still have to apply for the 25 rule in the US? Do you already answer that one? Yeah, the answer yeah. is yes, unless it's come from the US originally, sold in the US to somebody, then shipped it to Japan, then you can ship it back. Uh, although not a lot of Mercedes have had that done to it, but you can find like Hummers and like GMC trucks like Yukon, Escalades, that kind of thing. Acura NSX is strangely you can find. Ooh, what's that? Some comment got flagged. Oh, we've seen that with a lot of the option picks. Oh, yeah. yeah everybody, everybody's being nice, but they, because it's, a, it's like a string of random text, it's flagging it. Bill Courtney sent in a variety of picks in different categories. That's cool. Thanks, Bill, for sending those all in. You're the man. He has weird trucks category and cool sedans category. Do you want okay. a weird truck or a cool sedan? Mike, pick. Let's go weird truck. Uh, Wait, you picked a bad one last time, Mike. I don't know uh, if I trust you anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's not bad. It's It was interesting and unique. <laughs> None of Bill's picks would be bad, right? B uh, I guess not. <laughs> there are no bad cars. I don't know, he's got a mirror walkthrough as one of his cool trucks, so... All right. Weird trucks. Bring um, it. You want, you want the walkthrough? Sure. 40016 at Bayhawk. I think it's a walkthrough. He called it a Pope Mobile, so that's what I imagine it a is. A Pope Mobile. The Pope Mobile needs more windows than this. What? 
do, 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 do. <laughs> Have you never seen one of these, Mike? Not if it's like not a Mr. Bean or something. <laughs> it's a key truck. Yeah. So basically, it's like a commonly used as a mobile food truck. And right. so this side opens, it makes a shelf here, and there's a window that you can sell stuff out of. Oh, and wow. for most people, they could probably stand inside mm -hmm. here. If you are under five foot 10, then you can stand up. I can stand up, but my heads will hit like the slats inside. The slats. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, cool. It looks like a shower door. Yeah, and then the back opens fully. Like it's a, um, yeah. yeah, it's a cool truck. Uh, I have seen some. I tried to buy one for inventory that had the front end converted to the Alto Works and then the engine and everything, which is the sports car version. <laughs> there's one of these on the channel still, I think. Yeah, there's uh, there are a couple of companies that make these. This one here is the Daihatsu Mira, and then they they also have one that's very similar looking that's made out of the Alto. That is what I was referring to. They're a little bit weird because they generally only have one seat. There is like a flip down seat next to it that doesn't have a seat belt in any of the ones that I've seen. Uh, and it's a bit annoying to get out because the driver doesn't have a door. And so the driver needs to get out the floor to ceiling door over here, but you have to step over the gear shift to get out, and it's a little bit it's a little bit ganky to step out of here over the gear shift and get out. Or I mean, you have your choice of doors. You can get out of this one or out of this one, and it would be roughly the same amount of effort to do either of that. They're cool trucks. I mean, you can bring them into the states. You can put your company branding on them, and everyone will take a look at you. Some of them will be pointing and laughing, but. You'll be driving unique Japanese cars. Auction sheet. Mm, I don't like this format for the auction sheet. It's difficult to read because they mix the sales points and the uh, report in one. And then just like that last sheet, they don't have any... Nobody presses the enter button at this auction, and so they just continue on, and it's really annoying. It has some rust on the back, dent on the roof. I mean, the condition's not that good. Mileage is unknown, but the odometer shows 3,000 kilometers, so it's probably rolled over once or twice. And then uh, price for this, maybe about 100 and 180,000 yen or so. They're not that expensive, but they're a little bit more expensive just because they're unique and there's, there's not an awful lot of these here in Japan. Okay, so we got a question? Shall we get into the rib sue question? For those that are watching right now and have not uh, been paying attention to what's going on in the industry, I don't expect everybody to. There's a company by the name of Rib Sue that has been in um, that has been in business for a number of years, and they just kind of up and left, which is a little bit strange because they were kind of one of the big boys in the importing scene. Um, they weren't our uh, they weren't our customer, and so we I don't know them personally. I've never spoken to any of them. They looked like they were a trustworthy company, and it's very strange that a trustworthy looking company that brings in tons of imports can just up and leave. And we know, I guess, quite a bit about our competition because that's what we do here. You know, you need to know about your competition if you're going to try to stay in business. Um, before I get into that, though, I just wanted to mention they're not really our competition because we sell to individuals and we sell to dealers and a lot of our customers are dealers. And so the dealer market, there's reasons to buy for them, from them and there's reasons to buy directly from Japan if you're into that as well. Um, and we can get into the details of that if, at a further question if you're interested in that. But uh, when it comes to, to Ribsu, they're not really our competition, so I don't feel that bad about getting mad at them. But there were very several reasons that we didn't like Ribsu. And typically we don't say that we don't like our competition ever. In fact, that's kind of a policy here. But since they're out of business, now we can kind of talk about them a little bit. And so Ribsu had, the first thing that really bothered me about them is they were saying, we have our own exporter in Japan so we can get you the cars at a lower price than anyone else and with more trust because we have our own company in Japan. But that wasn't true, and we've known that for a long time because you can look at the shipping, like international shipping reports, and you can see who their shipper was in Japan, and it wasn't a company named Ribsu. And so it is a little bit strange that they were claiming that that company was theirs, but in fact it was just branded as a Ribsu brand through some sort of an agreement. But the company in Japan exporting to them was no different than any other importer, so they didn't have any, any sort of a special thing other than they got their exporter to display a sign 
on their building that said Rivsu. And so that's a little bit strange to begin with that they would kind of, you know, skirt the truth like that. It's not really a big deal, but to me it is because, you know, if, if they're going to be lying about that, what else are they going to be lying about, right? And then the second thing is we get our customers sometimes send us invoices of cars that they buy from other companies and then they weren't happy with them and then they come and buy from us. And so we have kind of a, a number of invoices from other competition. And the amount that they charged for their buy direct from auction was just insane. It was about four times the average price here in Japan. And that's nuts to think that they would charge that much for a car and then like still like <laughs> they're doing pulling in like 20 or 30 cars per month or so and still seem to be having financial problems and then skip out that seems a little bit strange because they were making far more than we were per car bringing in but we did more work than they did per sale as well and so that's a little bit strange uh more than a little bit strange it's concerning to me that they were able to find customers who weren't looking at the entire industry at that and so we're not the cheapest exporter out there but I think that we're probably bottom 20% if you take out any of the hidden fees uh, so many exporters you know here's our fee and then here's the stack of other fees that are not included in what they say but they're kind of hidden fees and we don't like that and so that makes us one of the cheaper options because of that uh, it really sucks because a lot of people from Rivsu bought a car and then stored it in Japan and then the one guy on, what was the website? The Jalopnik? Jalopnik had, a, had an, an article last week about it but there was one a week before that on like Short Shift. Yeah. yeah. And so he was saying that he bought a car like four years in advance and then the car was staying at Rivsu in Japan which is another company, not really Rivsu. And then Rivsu in America didn't pay the Rivsu in Japan for that car and so he couldn't get the car and huh, it feels weird to me <laughs> complaining about competition even though they're out of business so we'll just uh, end it there but that's kind of the story uh, I don't like companies that are s uh, not being completely honest with everything they're, that they're talking about especially when it comes to promoting themselves and I don't like companies that drastically overcharge like that and I think in this case I don't know exactly the, the circumstances around it, but it seems to me like they got into, come into business assuming that they were going to make X amount of profit and then they lived the lifestyle of somebody who makes that much profit and then the profit just wasn't there. And so they used their customers' deposits, which was pretty crazy. They were asking for like $10,000 deposits and even more for some cars, full upfront payment for some of the R34s that they were bringing in. And yeah, pretty crazy. Pretty crazy that they would have financial problems despite all of the money that they were bringing in. Hmm. Okay, I feel a little bit dirty after talking about that, and so let's get into something clean. Oh well, no, let's get into something dirty. What? Two zero four, or sorry, six zero two zero. Hi, Seth Cosano. This is Andrew speaking. Andrew's on the phone now. What are we looking at there? Hey, I that? think it was a Land Cruiser. <coughs> yeah. Maybe? From Hiroshima. Okay. Well, I wonder how okay. they got rust yeah, on the roof here. We're, we're doing our weekly live stream right now, so Derek is on my computer because that's one setup for it. So if you have to reference the email, I can't pull it up right now. Sorry, Andrew. You guys can hear Andrew's conversation in the uh, background if you want. <laughs> It'll be over in about no, 40 me. minutes or so, but i got to grab lunch, so if you, if you can call... If okay, so Land Cruiser, Land Cruiser 40, uh, C3 okay. on the roof. This is really weird because the roof of these, yeah, as go, far as I knew, they were always channel. made out of fiberglass. Um, yeah, every, so, yeah, every Monday kind of strange that there's rust up there. Maybe there were some that were made out of metal, or maybe there's reproductions that are made out of metal. Yeah. I don't know. Somebody in the comments let me know because I don't want to be wrong about that. Okay, and so uh, okay. the Land Cruiser right, 40s. Um, All right, talk later, Justin. It's a uh, maybe a nine out of ten in terms of difficulty in buying one of these, and most of the reason is because these cars are old enough to have had one or two or three times of restoration cycle, but they still have enough value that people are keeping them on the road, and they're simple and easy to keep on the road as well. Parts are very available, but the biggest problem is rust with them and shoddy rust repairs. And this is another car just like the Skyline that I don't recommend that you buy from auction unless you are very brave or have um, 
Uh, not going to say what I was going to say there. <laughs> if you're brave, then you can buy these cards from auction. But generally speaking, what a lot of people do is they'll take a rusted out one, and then they will do the cheapest, cheapest, cheapest repair on it, really poor quality work that actually makes the car worse than having a rusty, rusted out, terrible condition car. And then um, sell it at auction, and they know that the auction, it's not easy to tell the condition of a car that has had rust repairs at the auction. It's a bit of a loophole because it will say something like W2, meaning repair marks. But for a Land Cruiser, because rust is so common, it usually means that corrosion was on there and then they just kind of ground it down, put on body filler, sanded it a bit, and then repainted it. And if the sellers are trying to do this cheaply, they'll use pork poor quality paint, poor quality paint job, poor quality rust repair, and then to go and redo it actually takes more effort than doing it correctly in the first place. And so a lot of people will buy one that on the sheet it looks all clean and nice, and then when they get it they're like, wow, this is a terrible conditioned car. The nice thing though is that prices here in Japan generally trend pretty low for the diesel ones, which are hard to find in many countries, like for example the US never got diesels, Canada got diesels of the 40 series except um, not very many of them and so it's still pretty popular to bring in the diesel 40s from Japan to Canada and then a lot of other places of the world these are kind of a worldwide uh, famous vehicle uh, nice robust solid front axle solid rear axle engine that lasts a good long time <coughs> very simple design that makes it easy to replace or repair any pieces that you need to uh, just the body Condition wise, it says 298, 532 kilometers. I wouldn't worry about mileage at all with these, to be honest. It's 3.2 liter diesel. This is a 41, and so it's the shortest of them. And they come in like three different lengths, but uh, most of them are this length, and then the longer ones are a little bit more valuable, and then the super long ones are even more valuable than that. So the value comes down to the rarity of that specific model for the most part. I do like the wheels though, looking good. Dashboard's cracked, seat is ripped, headliner is dirty, steering wheel grip it needs to be replaced, various corrosion, underside is large corrosion, front cross member dented. This would really be the kind that you want to get because you know about all the corrosion that's on it, not like repaired sections, there's no diamond plate riveted on here or, or new metal being welded in. But still, they can be pretty pricey. A bad condition one's about 500,000 yen, and the good condition ones here in Japan will reach a little over 2 million yen, so somewhere around 18,000 to 20,000 US dollars or so. But uh, a fully restored, super good condition one of these in the US can be 40,000, 50,000 dollars sometimes. So it really depends on how well it's been uh, restored. Oh, and this one's a weird one too because. Um, 82? No, 81. 81 came with two different styles of the rear doors. This one here is the barnyard doors, but they also come with a three door setup, which is really weird, where this section here is a hatchback, and then the bottom section here has two barnyard doors. And those are the early models. They, like the, the original ones came like that, and then they realized that's kind of a bad setup. Um, because it's a little bit annoying and more expensive to build. And you can tell the difference because the one with the lift up gate is going to have a single window in the back instead of a split window. <coughs> okay, so we got some more questions. Yeah, I got a good question for you from great username Diecast. Yeah, uh, sorry, Diecast Construction World. Hello, Diecast Construction World. You sound like a channel my three year old would love. Wants to know what are the chances of buying a car at buying a car at auction and finding out it's stolen or a repo. Hmm. So far we've never had to deal with any of that stolen cars sent to auction or repos. I don't think that uh, it would be a very wise thing for somebody to do is steal a car in Japan and then send it to auction where they're going to check if there's any police reports or stolen car um, reports on that. Uh, you would have to be a really incredibly dumb criminal to do that and for like stolen cars you, you know a lot of people say that Japan doesn't really have any stolen cars and I think that Japan as a country tends to underreport the crimes that they have as an incentive for fewer people to do crimes because in Japan people tend to like to act within a, a spectrum of responsible social behavior and so if the, I think the idea is if they don't see crime, then they won't do crime. And so the underreported crime is 
well, I guess a, a different topic, not for right now, but car thefts do happen here. I think they happen far fewer than most other countries, but most of the cars that are stolen, I imagine they get stolen to be exported immediately or stolen for chopped. Uh, I don't think that there's a big market here in Japan for stolen cars because the price of the cars in Japan itself is so cheap. So if you stole a car, it wouldn't be nearly as valuable as most other countries. You know, you you see cars at auction selling for $200 or $40 or $80. And so, you know, that's a lot of risk that you're putting in if you're going to be stealing a car like that. And then high-end cars are probably the, probably the only ones that get stolen, like tuner cars or maybe some newer cars but i think newer cars are more difficult to get away with stealing because of immobilizers and that sort of thing and so i would think that the risk of buying a car at auction that's been stolen is so low that you wouldn't have to worry about it i've heard it's happened once um, but in that circumstance it was a car that was stolen in italy and then found its way to japan somehow and then that car was exported to italy again for some reason and then they caught it when it was coming in um, so in that case the theft didn't happen in Japan, but uh, it is an unfortunate circumstance uh, for wh whoever bought that car Okay, what are good foods junk food in Japan says Kazi uh, Good foods. Um, I, you can probably tell by seeing how skinny that I am that I'm not really a foodie and so good food to me is uh, my wife's home cooking um, and so I'm gonna throw that one over to our uh, our teammates over here. What's some good food in Japan? Mm, tonkatsu, yeah. okonomiyaki, takoyaki, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yakitori. Japan's kind of known as a country that has very high end food compared to other countries. You know, people are like, oh, France has the best cooking. I think the best cooking might actually be in Japan, but one of the problems is the, the best cooking can be very expensive and really not that much higher quality in my opinion. I went to, when my dad came here just a couple of months ago, we went to uh, um, like a, just a regular Japanese style restaurant and I think the bill was maybe like 500 or $600 for the seven of us and we, we ate the food and it was like, it, I mean it's good but really not worth the price that we paid and sorry if my dad's watching because he was the one who paid for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just thought about that. That would be kind of rude. <laughs> Thank you, Dad, for, for paying for everything. It wasn't that good. <laughs> I, I He's retired now, so I, I hope that he has other things to do than to watch my, my live streams. Sure Love Lawson's Chicken Strips, says Bill Courtney. Yeah, co convenience stores here have generally much better food than convenience stores in other countries, but I eat it too much of that at work, and so I just... I don't want to have any more convenience store food unless I have to. But even so, like in, I mean, it's it's a completely different thing. If you're in the U.S. and you told somebody you got a salad from 7-Eleven, they'd ask you, were you trying to get food poisoning or something? <laughs> yeah, the salads at 7-Eleven are good. Uh, actually, a lot at 7-Eleven is good. The 7-Eleven in general here is a, a higher-end establishment, I think. Mm -hmm. There's no, yeah. there's no hot dog rollers where they've been sitting there just going round and round for weeks. I forgot so, about yeah. those. And there's no Slurpee machines here, which is a little bit weird because you'd think it would be a good market for that. But here in Japan, like, convenience stores is, like, huge. It's a huge market. And so you have to have strong competition if you're going to fight the rest. So, yeah. No bad convenience stores in Japan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yakimiku, someone said? Yeah, Yakimiku is Korean barbecue. It's awesome. And a lot of those shops here, super popular. It's like um, Yakimiku is almost as popular as Chinese food is back home in the U.S. Just going through the comments here. Do you have any experience, advice on bringing a vehicle into Japan for a short period of time on a carnet de passengers in Doan? Uh, no, I, I don't. Well, I sort of have experience, and it's kind of a, an interesting story. There is this person from the UK who was participating in a worldwide rally of like 10 different countries. And then after they were done that, Toyota paid them to bring their car to, because it was a Toyota Starlet, like a 1980, second generation Starlet, 1985. It was one of these guys. Uh, so, t 
Toyota paid them to come bring the car to Japan to do some sort of press thing because this car had like 700,000 kilometers on it and it was super rad. And one of our customers was contacted by this person and then our customer asked us if we would help him store the car and export it from Japan from them because Toyota wasn't going to handle that. And so we did. It had a stack of papers in it of like stamps, like sort of like a passport with visa stamps in it and stuff. Uh, different papers from each country, but I don't know the process of that. Um, I think it, like you can do it here in Japan. I think it might be a little bit tricky because you very rarely ever see non-Japanese cars in Japan. And then if you're a tourist, you can't just come to Japan and buy a car here and then drive around. They're very strict when it comes to that sort of thing. And a side note, this car has the same wheels as on our RX-8. And they probably look better on this than they do on the RX-8. Actually, while you're on Starlet, Leslie wants to know, is a Starlet GT Turbo a cheap car to buy nowadays? Yep, it's still cheap considering how cool it is. The Starlet, uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I don't remember the chassis code of that, but it's like a 1990 Starlet Turbo. These ones are awesome race cars. They come with a 1.3 liter turbo engine, front wheel drive but they actually handle really well on the track and so when you go to a track for especially the tighter tracks these are really popular cars they're really cheap to buy and really cheap to have as a race car and racing is an expensive hobby and so getting a cheap car that you can race in is a good idea you can buy these the ones that are not US legal yet like this one's not US legal yet because it has the round headlights this one would be um, Non-US legal ones you can get for about 150 to 200,000 yen, and then the US legal ones I think you would probably be paying around 300,000 to 350,000 for them. Uh, they're not really fast cars, a 1.3 turbo is never really going to be fast even though they're only like 790 kilos, but uh, they are cool little cars, you know, uh, about the same size as an EG6 Civic, maybe a little bit smaller than that. And uh, I think pretty cool outside of Japan, I think probably a little bit slower than an EG6 Civic on the track, but uh, much cheaper, much, much cheaper. Those starlets go for a lot of money used, says uh, Elias. Uh, will fast Hondas ever go down in price? No, I think that they're going to continue to go up in price because Hondas were really, really awesome for most of the 80s and, and basically all of the 90s, and then they stopped making cars that were lightweight and easy to track. Uh, they got cheaper and not as good and so the the price of the good ones especially the good track cars like the EG6 or the EK9 they're going to continue going up a DC2 it's a better car than the Pulsar I don't know the Pulsar is pretty good too there's a um, 1.6 liter Pulsar with 100 and 160 horsepower that is really good too um, and then some Pulsars also came with the SR20 engines have you had any experience with pandas uh no no not really um thoughts on the new ctr uh the new civic type r i i suppose it's pretty good the second to newest one i've driven and it was very uh, impressed by it i think the new one would also be really good honda's gone away from the formula of lightweight excellent handling low powered cars and are kind of fighting with the fiesta sts of the world and i guess they to an extent kind of have to. The cars have to be heavier because of crash safety. They kind of have to have turbos in order to be high performing and still fit with economy standards. And so it's it's unfortunate, but their cars are getting more complicated. They're still really good cars though. So. New cars are so boring. Um, yeah, sometimes. I mean, uh, get some experience driving a lot of new cars and you might think differently. I prefer old cars as well, but I'm kind of crazy when it comes to my like of certain cars. We got an auction pick. Luxury ball yeah. one. Yeah. No, I'm gonna scroll back and find that one. Mm. <clears throat> Pulsars fell apart. I don't know what that means. Fell apart. No, Pulsars are all AED, all wheel drive, plus go. SR20. Yeah, only the GTI R are that, but there are far more Pulsars, even fast part Pulsars that don't have the uh, GTI R. Three five six. Three five six. Not sure which auction is it. Toyota Crown Royal Saloon. Crown Royal Saloon. There's only one that comes up. Okay. 
And so people always ask me, from the, especially from the US, what's a cheap car that I can buy and I can import and sell and make money? And this is pretty much the easiest go-to answer for that. Almost everything that's a sports car or a drift car or remotely fast or a 4x4 or a diesel engine is generally pretty expensive and with smaller margins. If you go for something that's generally high volume here in Japan, like the Crown, you can get them for pretty cheap because the demand for them hasn't outlived the supply or, or pushed up against the supply curve. Uh, these I think are classy looking cars, they're very well built, they're basically like an LS400 but a Japanese version, a little bit more restrained looking. But compared to the LS400 I think would look better in the US because they would be very unique there. Uh, they handle modifications really well, they come stock with air suspension and they come with the same 4 liter V8. So good cars all around. Prices for them, you can get them for as low as about 150,000 yen, but those ones aren't going to be that good. Probably up to about 350,000 on the high end. Sometimes a little bit higher than that for an exquisite one or one that already has like VIP modifications or big rims or something like that. So this one, 1991 Royal Saloon V8. Auction read 4, interior C, exterior C. Has a big dent on the door. Let's see if we can see that can't really see it maybe a little bit like right here front tires have zero millimeters of tread on them hmm a3 back here you know what that looks like <laughs> we have a stack of, of drift spare tires right now in our sitting area and we I don't know what to do with them and they're like one of them the belt came off like it's split and it's just like wires hanging off of the car uh, off of the tire Exterior shallow scratches, interior dirty, seat cigarette burn medium, seat uh, stain medium, steering wheel wear, molding scratched, exterior one part paint fade, and then pretty low mileage at 70,000 for 1991. Rear curtains, that's pretty cool. Also, if you can get one of these with the sunroof, the sunroof has curtains that are the same style of like curtains on a curtain rod kind of thing, which is really weird. I think that a lot of the station wagon versions of this have that. And the station wagon version of this is really cool too because you can get it with the 1J turbo engine and they have rear facing seats as an option. But if you can get both of those with like both the turbo engine with the rear facing seats is a hard thing to get and so don't count on it. If you find one go bid high on that. <coughs> uh, price wise on this I would say probably around uh, 220,000 yen or so. Prices have gone up on these quite a bit in the last year. Uh, but still they're relatively cheap compared to other imports <clears throat> and if you're looking to make money you can buy this type of car you can buy five of them for the same price as you can buy like a uh, Skyline GTR and so with five cars you're spreading out your risk and maybe you're getting like two thousand dollar profit for each one of those so ten thousand dollar profit it can be kind of tricky to get ten thousand dollar profit off of one GTR so it's kind of a better business decision to be buying these unless you have enough money to buy tons of GTRs at a time like Ribsu did, right? Their mm. showroom always had tons of GTRs in it. <clears throat> okay, on to the next one. What do we got? Hang on. Pick or a question. Give me a question. A few people asking about the R33s mm. thing. Thing is it hot right now? Is it not? What are they going for? Mm, I would say they're not hot mm. at all. Mm. Like mm. very few people are asking about them. That's weird, isn't it? There aren't that many R33s. I suppose what I think is going to happen here is the um, same thing that happened with the R32. So when the GTR became legal, the GTST, the turbo non-GTR version of it, was already importable for a little amount of time and nobody really cared about that car that much. When the GTR became legal, suddenly the floodgates open and everybody wants a GTR, prices of GTR went up, and then prices of the GTST went up when the GTR kept going higher and then people just didn't have enough money to buy the top one so they went for the lower grade one. Still a, a fantastic car but in my opinion a little bit overpriced right now. The R32 though has always been kind of a, a car that the Japanese public has a really loved for a very long time. Especially since it was the car that really put Nissan back, in, back on the map when it came out. It was very modern for its day, the GTR kicked some serious butt, the GTR's back, you know. 
Um, the R33 hasn't been as loved in Japan as the R32 was, and because of that, the GTSTs, uh, most of them got exported out of Japan. So supply of the GTSTs of those, I think it's going to be much lower than the R32s were. And so that means the price is probably going to go up a little bit faster than the R32s did once people start seeing them come in. I think a lot of people don't realize that they're legal for import from, I think, August of this year? I think so. I think it's August of this year. So you can buy them now, and then they ship next month, and then they will land in August. So they're not coming in yet. I think when people actually start to see them and drive them and feel them, I think that they're going to love them because they're a heck of a lot faster than the R32s. The styling of them mm. is... <laughs> I, uh, Mike, Mike's laughing about that. The styling of them is a lot cooler now than it was when it came out, I suppose. A lot of people poo-pooed the styling of that. And, you know, it's... I think it looks very much like a 90s Japanese car, which is a cool thing now. A lot cooler than it was back then. Um, so I think we'll see prices go up, and I think we'll see more interest in about six months or a year. So it would be an interesting one to buy now in hopes that you can um, resell it for a profit like a year or two down the road. Somebody said, good question here. You had mentioned camping cars are a risk at auction mainly due to the lack of interior pictures. Any expectations? How many horror stories, ha horror stories have you heard of? All the horror stories I've heard of have happened within our company um, because I don't hear about other people buying campers coming from other people, uh, other exporters. Uh, I wouldn't say horror stories so much as uh, a difference between the expectation of the customer and what they actually end up with. And it doesn't really happen so much anymore where customers are upset about what they receive because when somebody asks for a camper, we're usually very upfront about exactly what I said last time. You don't get to see the interior, so you don't know the layout of it. It might be really trashed on the interior. It might need the fridge replaced. It might need the shower replaced. It, you know, campers are like mini houses. And so for most people, if you want a camper, go to go to a camper dealer in your country that imports these from Japan and fixes them up. You're gonna pay a lot more for it, but you get more choice in what you get. That's, I think for most people, the safer way to buy and the better way to buy, but it's gonna cost you a lot more. And so if you're gonna, if you want to bring it in yourself, you're a handyman and you wanna fix it up yourself, then by all means buy from Japan and then you can customize it any way that you want. Um, the market saturation on, on the arguably better R32 in the USA is insane. Um, I don't, I wouldn't call it insane. Um, the U.S. is a country of 350 million people, is that right? 350 million people in the States? About that. You have to have a lot of uh, R32s in order to saturate the market. I think that there are a lot of people bringing them in to resell, and so it might look like market saturation more than there actually is market saturation. It depends. The more of them on sale at a time, the less easy it is to sell them for big money, and so the market adjusts itself there. You got one next? 214. And what are we looking at here? We are looking at uh, a Stalic Granza V. I'm going to look at this instead. <laughs> okay, it's not as cool as I thought that it was. Starlet. JU Tokyo. Uh, I'm going to look at this one as well. Whose pick is this? The Starlet? Mm -hmm. uh, Leslie Lee, I believe. These are awesome minivans. It looks like a station oh, wagon because it's been lowered, but it's awesome. Okay. Here we go. We already talked about Starlets a little bit, so I don't have much else to talk about. This is the final generation of the Starlet, though, after this. Toyota stopped making fun cars. And I don't know what year these ended, but I think it was around 2002 or something. This would be, I think, the first year. EP91. Okay, so underside, well, because I already just spoke about, spoke about um, starlets, I'm just going to go over the sheet here. It's an auction grade 3, interior C, exterior C. The body has a, a C3 corrosion hole here that's going to be the size of a softball. You can kind of see it in the picture here. And so there's no purpose in buying this car at all unless you just wanted the engine. Um, the chassis of this can be worth something, but one with 
structural damage like that is not going to be used in racing. Also, engine room has corrosion in it, underside corrosion. That's why it's a good idea to always look at this first, and you're like, oh, corrosion hole, okay, I'm going to go buy an Odyssey instead. And this car, actually, you can get these with 180 horsepower, and so more, more power than the Starlet, and may even be pretty good on the track because four-wheel double wishbone suspension and blue headlights. Ooh. Back to the Starlet, though. Yeah, uh, tail ends cracked. Yeah, not cool. Auction grade three can sometimes be surprisingly good, but not in this case. Rear corner panel corrosion hole large. Yeah, so that's basically like my Honda City. Open up the trunk, and then you get to see corrosion city around the outside here, or the inside of the uh, trunk section. No good. It's gonna sell for 50,000 yen or something. Um, just enough money for the parts and then someone's gonna buy it and tear it down into parts and then sell them on Yahoo auctions or export the parts somewhere can you tell the miles so some of us can understand lol uh, I can't do the math in my head that fast Tony Tony counts um, but if you want you just can just divide it by, by 1.6 1. 1. yeah that's the fast way yeah that's the fast way for people who can do math in their head your phone's got a every phone has a calculator on. If you got a smartphone, yeah. so I'll, I'll just start here with a phone own. and I'll be well, doing all the you. calculations. People should figure out how to do it by themselves. It's not that difficult to pull your phone out and do a quick bit of math on the calculator. Toyota Cavalier. Yeah. Hey, who found a Cavalier? Do we have an auction number for that? Um, five zero one five zero USSR Nagoya. Uh oh, USS. Yeah. Can't show Sorry. it. Copyright. Uh, but in case people didn't know. Toyota had an agreement with General Motors of all companies where, you know, the Cavalier, like one of the worst cars ever made, they badged that as a Toyota and sold it here and nobody bought it. Like, I, th I think there were only like a, a thousand units sold or something like that because why would anyone buy that? <laughs> it's like, like Chevy at that time was like the opposite of Toyota in terms of market position uh, or at least quality of the cars. Um, the engine was terrible, the interior was terrible, the driving was terrible. It's like there's there's nothing good about that car. And the Pontiac Sunfire was the badge engineered version of that. The R33 didn't do very well in Canada. Yes, different market though. I think that there were a lot more of them available for Canada. I think that uh, nowadays it's harder to find good rear wheel drive sports cars and the RB25 is a fantastic engine. And so I think that the US is gonna eat it up far more than Canada did 10 years ago when it just became legal there. I swear the Cavalier and Mitsubishi shared body components. Okay, I don't know about that, Bill, but maybe. Did you get the Ford Taurus in Japan? Uh, I've never seen one here, so I don't think so, but I have seen the Ford um, Thunderbird Super Coupe, a number of them here, and those are rad cars. And the Mercury Cougar X something. Um, supercharged 3.8 liter, I think, or 3.6 liter. And then only 210 horsepower. How do you get 210 horsepower out of a supercharged 3.6 liter? I don't know. Yeah, give me that next one. 21 at J.U. Mie. J.U. Mie. It was described as baller luxury. Baller oh, yeah. luxury, that's a good start. 21. This is the century, right? Let's find the baller luxury. Oh, none of these cars look baller luxury to me. Except for maybe this one. No century. It might be on the second page. Oh. We've got seven more minutes left in the stream, and then you guys get to wait till next week. And next week, hopefully, I won't be sick. I'm feeling pretty terrible right now. <coughs> Okay. We have two fire trucks coming in today. One's getting dropped off outside here. Yay! Show it to my son. He loves the fire trucks. Okay, so the Toyota Century is the top end Toyota car. This one's a little bit odd because it has leather seats. I have never seen a Century with leather seats. They almost exclusively have fabric seats. And I heard, and I'm not sure if it's true, but I heard that the reason why they don't have leather seats is because Japanese people 
want to blend in and they don't want people to hear when they move their bums on the seats. And the leather seats will make a uh, sound when you move your bum. I don't know if that's true. Looks like one of the mirrors is falling off. Yeah, uh, Century's cool because you can get it with a V12. This one here is a V12 model. Toyota's only ever V12 that was only put into this car. And then uh, a super tuning company, Top Secret, put it into their super, which is kind of cool, but only, like, it's not, it's not really a good engine, but it's a V12, and so that's what makes it cool. Uh, apparently it puts out 280 horsepower from a 5 liter, but it's full luxury and comfortable and smooth when you're driving it. And that's why V12, I suppose? I don't know. Whenever I buy a V12 Jaguar, I'm like, why? Why did you put so much com like complexity into the car and then not make a good car around it? <laughs> that's why they're so cheap, those Jags with the V12. Okay, so Toyota Century, 108, 650 kilometers is very high for this car, uh, let alone this one's unknown mileage. This color change to black, that's really weird too, because almost all of these were black to begin with. Black or like maroon or dark blue. I've never seen a white one, I don't think they made it. Oil leak, wonder how many arms and legs you have to sell in order to fix that on a Century. Air suspension doesn't, well, this, this car is terrible. This is the worst car ever made. Not um, Bola Luxury. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely not Baller Luxury. This is like the, the car that people want, who want to be Baller Luxury buy and then don't fix the air suspension. Uh, yeah, it's not going to sell for very much. Maybe 230,000 yen or so. I do like the Century in general. I'm not a huge fan of the Century. I don't, uh, I, I think that for a car this big, you need to have more leg room in them. Like especially for the driver, you have to be like five inches shorter than I am to comfortably drive it because the seat doesn't go back far enough because they gave all the leg room to the people in the back. And I don't ever want to be driven around in a car and so that to me has no utility. I think the fact that the car exists is cool and I think that a car can be cool but I think that uh, they really need to do a better job on a car if they're going to sell it for $100,000 new. Okay, someone sent in the Lupo GTI. I know somebody else sent that in. Maybe maybe it's the same person. We just bought a Lupo GTI, and we got a number of videos on the channel from them. We buy them semi-frequently. They basically all go to the same person <laughs> who is addicted to Lupo GTIs. And to, I guess, like, we don't get very good view counts of the Lupo GTIs when they go up on YouTube. And so I think for the, like... For our customers, they're not that interesting, except for people who like them, really like them. You get a 1600cc twin cam engine that is pretty sweet, I think 120 horsepower, or 125, somewhere in there. These are the stock wheels. The body is like one and a half inches wider on each corner to give it better stability in the corners. It therefore also might have different suspension um, geometry other than just the lowered springs. And uh, yeah, they're sweet cars. There's, uh, they look really weird from the side view because, we, yeah, we have a side view. They look very similar to the Honda City from the side view because the wheels are pushed right out to the back. That wheel almost looks like it's broken. That's weird. Uh, good cars. Uh, is this left-hand drive or right-hand drive? This one is right-hand drive. But, oh, what's that? It's wet? Oh, okay, that's just a reflection of the windshield. And they sell for pretty cheaply, like 100,000 100, yen to 180,000 yen, sometimes up to 250 if it's really sweet for the right-hand drive ones. Left-hand drive ones sell for a little bit more, maybe about 30 to 50% more because they're the original uh, steering wheel layout because, you know, Germany is left-hand drive. Okay, what else do we got here? Question or option? Give me a question. Question, uh, someone's asking about RX-7s now that they're importable to the USA, prices, popularity. When they first became legal to the USA, prices went up big time. They went from basically 500,000 yen cars to 1.5 million yen cars. And so a huge jump in prices. But now they've settled down in a way that the R32 never did, uh, GTST or GTR. And I think part of the reason for that is there's 
There are a lot of people online who love to make fun of the rotary engines and say that they are very unreliable, and to an extent they are, but I think that that's overblown. I think if you own one and you like the quirkiness of the rotary and the sound of it and the feel of it, then go and buy one. It's, it's not any... I mean, it's probably a little bit more unreliable than a 25-year-old car, but if you own a 25-year-old car, it's going to be unreliable anyway. And so might as well jump into it, and then when the engine poo-poo's out, rebuild it, and you've got a good car for a long time. And they're such good-looking cars, good-performing cars. The only downside is if you're super tall, you can't fit into them. So if you can fit into those cars, I highly recommend it. Though there's a good chance that you buy one and it comes with low compression. And that's just a reality of buying the cars from auction. So that's part of the reason why the price is so cheap. And if there was a higher chance of getting one with high compression at auction, the price would be higher, maybe $2,000 or $3,000 more. And then the cost of a rebuild is only going to run you about $4,000 on that anyway. So. 2J swap, I think it's the wrong car to do a 2J swap, even though I think 2J swaps are pretty sweet. Uh, Rotary is extremely popular in Puerto Rico. I did not know that, but I know that they have an awesome car scene there. I would like to go sometime. $10,000 for rebuild, Derek. I know everything. No, you don't. We. I just priced one out because, <laughs> because I'm rebuilding one at the moment, which actually doesn't need to have a rebuild. I'm sending it back to auction. Uh, maybe those are the prices in the US, though, or whatever country that you're in. RB swap. No, you don't want a heavy engine in that car. That's the thing. Um, if you have an RX-7, the only swap, and you guys are going to kill me, is you got to put an LS in there because the, an LS is a relatively lightweight engine for the amount of power. The only thing it has is an image problem because LS in a rotary is kind of like kicking yourself in your own nuts. What do you think about the interior on all Japanese sports cars? I think the interior is kind of bad on Japanese sports cars, but I interior on all cars during the 90s and beginning of the 2000s was pretty bad as well and I kind of like the badness of Japanese interiors um, especially if that's what you're used to if you want to just uh, just buy a Corvette yeah I mean Corvettes are good cars Derek said nuts yes it's true Bill sorry uh, pla show that comment plastic usually sucks yeah a lot of Japanese sports cars have uh, deformation especially Toyota and Nissan or cracking of the dashboard that would be Mitsubishi and Nissan um, and then parts for Japanese interiors are getting a little bit uh, harder to find these days for 80s and 90s cars so what does low compression mean Low compression means that you're not getting all of the power that you were supposed to get in your engine because you're getting your uh, combustion chamber is leaking a little bit out of there. And so you think of it like a plastic bag. If you blow up a plastic bag and then you, you go bam like that, then it'll all come out all at once, right? But if you blow up the plastic bag and you put a whole bunch of holes in it and you go Phew, then it's not going to be as strong of a bang anymore. And I hope, I hope that makes sense because I've never even thought of it that way. It just came out. Um, and so what happens with the rotaries is because they use oil as part of the combustion of them, uh, like it'll mix fuel and oil and put them into the combustion chamber at the same time to give lubrication for the little tips of the um, rotary. Um, if you run low on oil, then you wear out your tips really quickly. And then you run out of oil because people who drive rotaries sometimes don't realize you have to top up your oil every once in a while. And then there's also the, th the fact that they wear out faster than piston engines anyway, um, even if you are keeping them. Somebody says apex seals. Yeah, uh, I'm, I, I was thinking about the word apex seal, except I don't didn't want to get too technical uh, because that person's didn't know what compression was and didn't want to speak in words that they didn't know. Uh, do, 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 do. We're getting too many comments here. We must have so many people. How many? 43 people? 70. 70! Yeah. Woo! Better than last week. They must have felt sorry for me when I was uh, crying on the stream. Uh, da, 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 da. Dubai is good for 80s and 90s Toyota parts? Yes. Cool. That's good to know. Um, and I'm going to show you guys uh, a secret homepage for the homeboys um, Toyo DIY if you ever have a Toyota car you're going to love this website because you can um, they have a parts catalog and you can enter your 
VIN number into this right here, and then it will show you basically everything from trim codes of the car down to uh, parts lists, uh, parts prices, everything that you need. It's super awesome. They used to have parts diagrams, but that was copyrighted, so it had to go off like eight years ago or 10 years ago or something. But it's been around for a long time, and it's a really good site, especially for people who don't have the electronic parts catalog. Okay, so I'm gonna have to cut it short here. Um, and we're gonna see everyone else next week. If I didn't get to your question, sorry about that. If it's a pressing question, then send it to us in an email and one of our nice people named Mike or Mike will answer that. Uh, we do have an announcement that's a fairly big announcement coming up this week, but I don't know exactly when that is coming. I'm hoping either today or tomorrow, so watch our channel for that. Um, it's kind of a biggest announcement of the year kind of thing next to hiring Mike. And so uh, have a look for that. And um, yeah, that'll just be it. So thanks everyone for tuning in and uh, enjoy the podcast once a week. Come back next week at the very same time and you can meet me again. So thanks a lot and see you later.